Hi, everyone. Good enough. All right, well, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and get started. Today is all about nerve cells. Uh, there's two broad categories of those. We got our neurons, and we got our glia. Uh, several of you made good use of the questions box and I'll, I'll make sure to get through those. Um, hopefully throughout the lecture and anything that, that I don't get through, I'll make sure and hit at the end. Um, I answered those, so you should see my answers on the, on the uh, spreadsheet below. Uh, let's see. If, uh, hold on, before we get started, are, are there, are there any issues I need to know about uh, and address before we get started? Cool. All right. Um, I won't, I don't think I see chats um, when I'm sharing the screen. So if you have a question, uh, you, you can just chime in uh, or you can add it to the chat box and I'll see it once I kind of pause from the slideshow. All right. Well, let's hop to it then. So we're going to go through the basics of how neurons work. And the, the big idea here is to understand that they generate electrical signals within themselves. These move, for the most part, from the dendrites into the cell body, into the axon. The electrical signal in the axon called the action potential, then stimulates the release of a chemical signal, the neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters usually create another electrical event. So that's that alternating pattern of electrical and chemical signaling. So we'll review that and I'll give you motor neurons as an example. And then we'll talk about neuroglia. Uh, there's a, a few different neuroglia. Their job is to support neurons. Uh, for the most part. They probably have some other nifty things that they do. I'm not going to focus on those too much. They undoubtedly support neurons and they do so in different ways. So we'll introduce our myelinating glia. We'll talk about our microglia. That's essentially the uh, resident immune system of the brain. Uh, for the most part, we keep blood separate from the brain. So white blood cells don't come in unless something awful has happened. And then we'll talk about astrocytes, uh, which I like to think of as essentially the mother of, of neurons. I think of neurons as little babies. Babies are specialized for communication. Uh, they do it quite well. They have no problem screaming, whether it's at home or in public. Uh, and they're communicating their wants. And that's pretty much what neurons are doing. They're communicating uh, sometimes over great distances. So here's the, the things that I want you to get. These are the overall learning objectives. So we'll make sure we can do all these things at the end. Basically, what's a neuron look like? Tell me about the soma, dendrites, and axon. I'm gonna do that in just a little bit. Let's make sure we get that electrical chemical pattern. That's all it is. That's how our nervous system works. Make sure you can at least name the neural glia and summarize their function. And then we need to understand a process called reactive gliosis. Because that's what happens in injury. And this class is all about injury and damage to the nervous system. And that reactive gliosis, like everything in life, is good except when it's not. So reactive gliosis can actually be an issue. Now, it, it intends to help, just like I intend to teach you, but sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes things go wrong. So the first half here is just gonna be about neurons. We're gonna focus on them because they're the star of the show, really. Even though astrocytes literally mean star cell, they're not really the stars. It's all about neurons. These are the cells that are specialized to communicate. That's their job. Communicate very rapidly over long distances so we know what's going on in the world. We can come up with a plan and we can execute it. Probably the most important job of the nervous system is to move our bodies around. And that's a fairly complicated task. We can do it quickly. Uh, because neurons operate very quickly. All righty. 
So this uh, picture here is showing you three different neurons. Uh, two of them are pyramidal. Uh, so those would be the, the, the left and the, the middle. Hopefully we can see my mouse. Anyone? I hope that's how I'm gonna be pointing to you. Okay, good. Pyramidal, pyramidal, stellate. Slightly different morphologies. So you can tell with the cell body, this kind of looks a little more like a triangle. Same thing here. This one's a little rounder. And you'll notice the, the dendrites are kind of emanating in a different pattern. Here we have this one apical dendrite coming up. It's very, very large. And we have some basal dendrites. We don't see that here. Dendrites are kind of emanating throughout the cell body. I will not ask you to distinguish pyramidal and stellate neurons. But the point is we have variable morphologies. Despite that, they all have something in common. All right, every neuron is gonna have a cell body. It's also called the soma, which just means body. The cell body you could think of as a typical cell. So if you've taken a biology class, that mammalian cell that you learned about, the cell body does all that stuff. It has the nucleus. It has the endoplasmic reticulum, it has the Golgi apparatus, uh, it has uh, the lysosomes, it has all the organelles. So this is really the heart of the cell. This is where we make the bulk of our proteins. That's probably the biggest job of the cell body is to make proteins, to express genes, and then to move those proteins throughout the cell. Some uh, protein synthesis does take place in the, in the dendrites, but no protein synthesis takes place in the axon. And these axons can cover considerable distances. And if something happens in life, a protein did it. That means we have to move proteins over a very long distance so that our neurons function properly. As you might imagine, this is one of the places where life can go wrong. So we'll see this in some diseases. If we're unable to move proteins properly down the axon, the axon dies, the neuron is no more. And that's because protein synthesis takes place in the cell body. It has what we call nissel substance, that is ribosomes. So in this image here, there was a question, how do we tell dendrites and axons apart? Well, one of the things you can do is look for nissel substance. All the purple stuff here showing you nissel substance. So we can see our nucleus. Here's the nucleolus here. Here's the cell body. And coming off of that, we have some dendrites. Dendrites are, uh, at least in the proximal sections, usually larger than axons. Notice they're faintly purple. Not quite as purple as the cell body here. The axon, same color as the background. No nissel substance. We don't make proteins in the axon. We can a little bit in the dendrites. The cell body is also important because it's right there in the center of the cell. So all those electrical signals that we generate in the dendrites filter into the cell body, collect there, and then the determination is made. Do we excite the axon? That brings me to the axon here. Its purpose is to conduct the action potential over some great distance very, very quickly to release a neurotransmitter. So the axon converts electrical signaling within the neuron to a chemical signal that it passes to its target, whether that be another neuron like I've uh, drawn in this cartoon here or a muscle so that we can move. Neurons spit out neurotransmitters to affect other cells. They generate electrical signals within themselves so that they can communicate quickly. So in the axon, you need to be thinking action potentials. That's shown right here on top. That's that red trace. We go from a negative membrane potential to positive, then there's a little hyperpolarization and we're back. That positive potential right there causes the release of neurotransmitter. Those neurotransmitters create some sort of usually an electrical event in their target cell. We go from electrical to chemical and back to electrical. And the dendrites are where we make that transition from chemical back to electrical. They have neurotransmitter receptors. Those are just surface proteins that receive neurotransmitters. And when they receive them, something happens. There's two general classes. There's ionotropic or ion channels. These are neurotransmitter receptors that create a fast electrical event. Then we have metabotropic receptors. These are attached to some enzyme. So these stimulate a protein to do something. These are gonna be much slower, but they, they're more long lived. So they have their advantages and their disadvantages. When we get input at our dendrites, here's a little cartoon neuron with a few different inputs to its dendrites. These blue axons here are firing action potentials. We can see a little train of six action potentials in each of them and each action potential causes the release of neurotransmitter. 
That neurotransmitter binds to receptors and creates electrical events. That's what we're seeing here, these synaptic potentials that build up within the cell. If they build up enough, the axon fires an action potential as shown here. So the action potential is massive. We go from negative to positive. Synaptic potentials are fairly small and they have to sum together to make the neuron fire. So neurons are very democratic, at least in the central nervous system. That site where they sum up is the cell body, more specifically, the initial segment of the axon. And those are the three parts of a neuron. You got your cell body right in the middle. That's where we make our proteins. You got your dendrites. Those are basically the ears of the neuron. They receive chemical input and create electrical events. Those sum in the cell body. And if they are exciting enough, the axon fires an action potential and that electrical event moves down the axon and stimulates chemical release. All neurons have one axon with no exception. Neurons have variable numbers of dendrites though, and that's what gives them their unique morphologies. You have to have an axon. If you don't have an axon, you're not gonna communicate very well. All neurons have some kind of dendrites. They just don't always have true dendrites that come off the cell body. The bipolar cell, they have true dendrites. So if you look here, B, bipolar cell. We got our cell body right in the middle. There's a kind of brown axon. There's the blue dendrites here. You'll notice this makes kind of a nice straight line and some neurons need to function like a straight line. Like in the retina, all we're doing is saying how much light is in this little part of the retina. So we have little bipolar cells there that collect light in a very small region and then communicate with their downstream target. What's going on in this very little bit of space? The same thing is true for pseudo unipolar neurons. We don't have unipolar, so I'm gonna gloss over those, but we do have pseudo unipolar neurons. These start off as bipolar. And then through development, they fuse their dendrites and axon. Pseudo unipolar neurons would be our somatosensory neurons. So those neurons in the dorsal root ganglia, they can feel what's going on in our body, whether it be tactile or painful uh, or temperature sensation. Again, it's just a straight line. What's going on right here? I don't need to talk to my neighbors to figure it out. If I have pain in my knuckle, I just need to know that. There's nothing to figure out, no voting needed. Is it really painful? No. Some processes are a little more complicated though than saying, do I have a boo-boo? Some things are gonna be more complicated like, how do I uh, put these words forth so that you understand this idea in my head? There's a lot more voting that goes on there. We have to choose our words carefully. We wanna make sure that we're clear, concise, and hopefully not too offensive. And multipolar neurons are going to be critical for that kind of computation. Notice they have multiple dendrites. That's why they're called multipolar. Not just the one, whether it's true or not. They have multiple coming off. So in part D, here's a few different examples of multipolar dendrites. Each of those dendrites represents its own little computational unit or a little area where they can get input and they can think about multiple types of inputs. So something complicated like motor function, it's always gonna be multipolar neurons carrying that out because that's way more complicated than just saying what's going on in this little tiny piece of skin. We have to consider where is our body right now? If I wanna touch my nose, I need to know where is my nose? Where's my finger? Is there anything in the way? How long are my arms? How can I do this? You might not be impressed by this, but this is actually pretty tough. And we'll see some examples of folks who have damage to their nervous system. And this becomes a difficult task, but it's not so difficult for us. We have multipolar neurons that can take into account multiple bits of information to come to some decision. Some have more elaborate dendritic arbors like the beautiful Purkinje cell down here in the bottom right. And some are a little less elaborate, but they're still multipolar. They can still think about more than one thing. Some dendrites lack these things called dendritic spines, or what we call aspiny neurons. And others have dendritic spines. Spines are just little tiny protrusions that come off the dendrite. And what these do are create flexible synapses. They can grow, they can shrink. They allow us to learn and forget 
That's what we think about with dendritic spines. If something is important, if some connection matters a whole lot, we strengthen it. And we do that mostly with dendritic spines. We make the synapse much bigger. If we were to destroy a segment of dendrite, we would lose all the dendrite after it. We can't just affect one bit of information by acting on the shaft of the dendrite, but we can do that with spines. So they make neurons even more flexible. You don't need to know much more about dendritic spines other than they exist and they make very flexible synapses. They can change in strength. We think they're important for memory. Axons, even though there's only one, many targets can be hit. <clears throat> Axons can branch extensively and hit many, many targets. Sometimes this is a problem. We'll encounter this in Parkinson's disease. Dopamine neurons, they only live in the midbrain, but they got to serve everywhere in the brain. So they have these huge axons that unfortunately runs up a bill and produces metabolic stress. The point here, even though you only see one axon, it doesn't mean we're only hitting one, one cell. Neurons can communicate to many targets. That one axon can become thousands uh, of, of terminals. Now, an important component of neuron function is, of course, changing the electrical potential at its membrane. That's what it's all about. Every cell has a charge at the membrane, and that's all the membrane potential is. Cells are, by and large, more negative than the outside world. So they have a negative membrane potential. Neurons change their membrane potential to rapidly change their function. So they can go from silent to active by going from a negative to positive membrane potential. That event is what we call the action potential because it's a very fast event. It's a spike. Now these are all or none. They either happen or they don't. There's no such thing as a half action potential. When we hit this thing called threshold potential, which we will talk about in great detail next semester, we then have a rapid change in membrane potential. That spike travels down the axon, depolarizes it, sorry, makes it uh, have a positive charge, and that positive charge causes the release of neurotransmitter. So what we're looking at here is a neuron. They've grown uh, in a dish and they put a little glass pipette on it. That's what's coming out the, the left side of it. That pipette opens up a small hole as shown in this cartoon. So we can actually sense the charge in this cell. We can also, deliver charge. That's what panel B is showing us. We deliver little square waves of current. We can make the cell even more negative. Well, not much happens other than it gets negative. It's already resting. It can't rest even more. We can deliver positive current to create positive charge. And if we deliver enough, we fire an action potential. Now what you'll notice as they deliver greater degrees of positive charge. So these last three square waves here, the height of the action potential doesn't change, but the frequency does. That's how we encode intensity. Not the height of the action potential, but the frequency because every spike causes the release of neurotransmitter. So if we fire one spike, we release a little. Two spikes will release probably about twice as much, rough ballpark. Three spikes, about three times as much neurotransmitter. So we encode three times the intensity by firing three action potentials. And if I were to spread that action potential out so that we can actually see what's going on. So here we're looking at the millisecond time scale. We hit threshold, we depolarize to a positive potential. That's because sodium comes in. Sodium has a positive charge. When positive charge enters the cell, the cell has a positive charge. Then we go negative. That creates the spike. That movement back to negative potentials is caused by the removal of potassium. From this, we should hopefully appreciate that we have to keep a proper balance of sodium and potassium inside and outside the cell. This will come up again in this class. So there's your action potential. We have an influx of sodium, depolarize. We spit out some potassium, go back negative. The purpose of that uh, action potential is to create the synaptic potential. 
So on the, on the other side of the synapse, in the dendrites, those neurotransmitters create some change in membrane potential. And like we saw, if these sum up enough to hit threshold, this purple neuron here is gonna fire an action potential and talk to its targets. So we have two types of synaptic potentials. They can either be excitatory, that is they make the membrane potential more positive and they can stimulate an action potential or they can be inhibitory. For now, we'll think of them as making the membrane potential more negative and thus less likely to fire an action potential. So we can turn neurons on or off based on which neurotransmitter we spit out. And there's a few of them. Here we can see a synapse, a cartoon synapse, of course, and a little uh, more, more detail. Um, not actually drawn to scale here, but the presynaptic side, think of this as the axon. These have little, little vesicles filled with neurotransmitter. And when we fire an action potential, that vesicle fuses and we spit out the neurotransmitter into the synapse. The neurotransmitter quickly crosses and binds to neurotransmitter receptors and then something happens. It could be an, uh, an ion channel opens, we get an electrical event, or we could stimulate some enzyme, like I've already said. The major neurotransmitters that I'd like you to know would be glutamate, GABA and glycine, acetylcholine, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and then there's some neuropeptides. <laughs> so there's a few. The, the principal ones for the central nervous system though, very simple, glutamate, GABA, glycine. Glutamate's excitatory. It's used all throughout our central nervous system. If there's an excitatory synapse, it's glutamatergic. Inhibitory synapses are GABA if we're in the thalamus and above. If you're in the brain stem and below, it's probably glycine. But both of these are used everywhere in the nervous system. They are the inhibitory neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine is really important for you to know because that's how we move our muscles and you all care about moving muscles. We'll hit these as needed. Let's have a look at this alternating pattern with an example that maybe you'll care about. How do we move? So the corticospinal tract runs from the cortex to the spine. That should be pretty obvious from the name. You'll hear that something, oh, something a lot. Corticospinal. Spinothalamic goes from the spine to the thalamus. The corticospinal tract goes from the motor cortex in your frontal lobes on down to the anterior horn of the spinal cord. That's the spinal part. And then from the spinal cord to the muscles. Now we have these improperly, improperly named upper motor neurons. I say they're improperly named because they're not actually motor neurons. They're inner neurons. They don't communicate with muscles, but we call them motor neurons. So we'll continue with that ruse. In your cortex, that's what's shown down here. That's the wrinkly bark. That's what cortex means. We have the primary motor cortex. And this is a large component of the cortical spinal tract and has a little map of the body. And it's done what it can to turn your body into a tube, just a straight line. You'll notice the feet are next to the legs. The, next, the legs are next to the trunk. The trunk is next to the upper limbs. Upper limb, of course, has the hand at the end. The fingers are at the end of the hand. So it makes good sense. There's a nice little map here. Neurons in the, uh, I don't know, let's say hand region are going to travel from the cortex downward. They're going to travel down in the corticospinal tract. So here's our hand region. We'll travel on down. We'll, we'll cross. Uh, once we exit the brainstem and enter the spinal cord, and we'll travel on down to hit some lower motor neurons. And what we're going to do to those lower motor neurons is spit out a little bit of glutamate. You remember glutamate, that's the excitatory neurotransmitter. So we're going to turn them on. And our lower motor neurons, which live below the upper motor neurons, so the name makes sense. My brain is above my spinal cord, yours is too. Those lower motor neurons exit the spinal cord and innervate muscles. And just as we have an orderly arrangement of upper motor neurons, well, by golly, we have an orderly arrangement of lower motor neurons as well. Those that innervate the limb are a little more lateral to those that innervate the trunk. Those that innervate higher parts of the body are above those that innervate lower parts of the body. So we got maps all over. If we didn't, it would be chaos. It's not though. We have maps. So if we excite our lower motor neurons, they then excite the muscle. 
All right. So let's run through that real quickly here. Here's my upper motor neuron. Now this has a bunch of dendrites, of course. We get a lot of different inputs because we got to think about our movements. We don't want those to just be junk. So we have some sort of plan. I want to touch my nose, all right? There's a few muscles that are gonna be involved, but I'll pretend like it's, it's just one neuron that's gonna do this. If I excite this upper motor neuron, it's gonna fire an action potential and it'll probably fire a few. But I get that synaptic input, that chemical input that creates electrical events in the dendrites. And I eventually excite my upper motor neuron. I create that electrical event, the action potential. And that travels down the axon, causing the release of neurotransmitter, in this case, glutamate. But that's my chemical component here. And that's gonna arrive at the dendrites of my lower motor neurons. If I have decided to go ahead and carry out this action and I provide strong excitatory input to my lower motor neuron, it's gonna fire an action potential too. And it'll probably fire several, but I'm just gonna draw the one there. And that's gonna cause it to release neurotransmitter. Again, chemical. Notice how we're alternating between chemical, electrical, chemical, electrical, chemical. And guess what this is gonna to do to the muscle? I'll take that silence to mean it's gonna create an electrical event. Absolutely. It's gonna cause the muscle to fire an action potential. It's gonna look a little different from uh, what neurons do, but they still fire action potentials. That's an electrical event. And that causes the muscle to contract. And so we move. We move through an alternating pattern of electrical and chemical signaling. That pattern is of course conducted through a well-organized series of maps in our upper uh, motor neurons, that is the cerebral cortex, and with our lower motor neurons, that is the anterior horn of the spinal cord. And so we can move. Dr. Pitt? Yeah. Um, does the lower motor neuron also release glutamate? No, it does not. Okay. Excellent question. The neurotransmitter here, acetylcholine. This is going to act on nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. They get that name because nicotine also acts on them. If any of you have ever used nicotine, you might notice that you feel a little shaky. There's a reason for that. Probably has something to do with nicotinic acetylcholine receptors at your muscles. Uh, some toxins will uh, prevent the activation of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and that's what paralyzes you. So if we can't release acetylcholine from motor neurons and stimulate nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on muscles, we don't move. So that's what uh, the alpha bungro toxin is going to do. And that's why you want to probably not handle poisonous snakes. Uh, Dr. Pitt? Yes. So are lower motor neurons also technically inner neurons or are they? Great question. Let's break that down. Inter. What does inter mean? Between. So an interneuron is between two neurons. That's why I call upper motor neurons interneurons. Notice they get input from neurons and they provide their output to neurons. Lower motor neurons are actually motor neurons because they innervate muscles, not another neuron. So they are not between two neurons. So no, I wouldn't call them interneurons. Excellent questions. Let me stop this share so I can see if there are any chats that have come up. No, no chats have come up. All right, cool. All right. So I think what we'll do, since I'm recording this, I'm going to uh, jump over checkpoint one and we'll, we'll, we'll hit that right at the end. So we'll, we'll go through our review questions. I'll, I'll bust you up into groups uh, at the end, but just for the sake of, of the recording so people don't have to watch the long, awkward silence, I'm just gonna forge ahead and we'll come back to the checkpoints.
Sound fair? All right. Can't argue with 11 people. All right. So let's talk about glia then. Glia means glue. And that's kind of what we thought of glia as being uh, when we were first describing them. They were just like uh, little packing peanuts that held the brain together. Uh, we didn't realize that they actually did a whole bunch uh, of nifty stuff. And there was a question, are, are glia just some sort of specialized form of neuron? I'm sorry, are astrocytes some specialized form of neuron? And they're not, they're glia, but I see why you would think that. And in fact, we think uh, astrocytes are, are probably very important and in many ways do kind of function like neurons, but they don't fire action potentials. They don't communicate over long distances. For now, let's think of astrocytes as just the mother of, of neurons. We're gonna start off with our myelinating glia. Myelin is this uh, lipid uh, rich uh, substance that's, that's created to surround axons. So you think of myelin as insulation, and that's what it is. We'll talk about how myelin does what it does next semester. But for now, what we need to know is that myelin does a couple of things. No matter where it is, it increases the conduction velocity of action potentials. So that this neuron right here, when it fires its action potential in the axon, it's gonna move much faster because of that myelin. It also decreases how much ATP the neuron has to spend on each action potential. Nothing in life is free, even action potentials. We gotta pay, we gotta pay an ATP. And that depends how many ions do we move. Here's the great thing about myelin. All along this myelin sheath here, so here's, looks like a Schwann cell to me, surrounding a segment of axon. There are no ion channels on this axon right here. No ions move across the membrane. So we don't create any additional work for the neuron. It doesn't have to pump that sodium out and pump the potassium back in. It doesn't have to spend as much ATP. That's a great thing as we'll find out. And when we lose myelin, it puts stress on neurons and neurons die. So in demyelinating diseases, that loss of myelin stresses neurons, oxidative stress kills neurons. More on that in two lectures. One thing they, they also do for us, at least in the central nervous system, is save space. <clears throat> so there's two ways that you can speed up the conduction of action potentials. The way that we do it is with myelin. You can insulate them and you can, you can isolate the inside from the outside. That's gonna help speed up electrical conduction. Just accept that for now. I'll tell you how it does it next semester. How invertebrates solve this problem is just by making their axon bigger. The biggest axon in our head is about 20 microns in diameter. In a squid, it's a thousand microns or one millimeter. So 50 times bigger. These things are huge. And that's why we first studied squids when we were figuring out the electrical uh, signaling in neurons because they're big enough to see with your eye. You can see their axon and stick a pipette in there. You can't do that with ours. The problem with this approach is that our spinal cords would be the size of, I don't know, like a Sequoia Redwood. Um, they'd be massive. Uh, we wouldn't be able to have anywhere near the computational power that we do if we had axons that big. So we use myelin to save some space. What a cross section of a myelinated axon looks like is this. So here's the axon. Here's a little mitochondrion. That's gonna help us pay the bill, create ATP for us. And then you, you can see here, layer upon layer of myelin, that creates insulation so that the action potential within the axon doesn't escape and can quickly move down through the screen there so we just have layers of myelin. And what that does is speed up conduction. So here's a cartoon version. Now, the thing is, this is not drawn to scale. Um, you, you would never see the end of this myelin sheath if it were drawn to scale because the internode or the myelin sheath is uh, about a thousand, a hundred to a thousand times longer than the node that is the area between the myelin sheaths. 
So you'd never see it. So they, they, they've just kind of made the, the internodes much, much smaller. Anyway, uh, it, it is true that we don't have ion channels. See all these little jelly beans right here in the membrane? Those are ion channels. <clears throat> That's what allows us to bring in charge and to allow charge to escape. In the myelinated region of the axon, no ion channels. The only thing we get is very fast passive conduction of electrical signals. In an unmyelinated axon, we have ion channels all across, so they're leaky. We're constantly leaking current. We have to constantly bring it in, and that's slow. So if we look across time, some arbitrary time scale of time one, two, and three here, you'll notice even though they started at the same position, our cartoon myelinated axon has gone about twice as far as the cartoon unmyelinated axon. It should be 10 times further, but it's a cartoon. The idea holds true. Conduction is much faster. This is too good to be true. It just lets us see the difference. Ion channels everywhere in unmyelinated axons, making it very slow and very inefficient from a metabolic standpoint. And then only little tiny areas that contain ion channels in the myelinated axon and these long stretches of myelinated regions that allow for fast propagation. We call this type of conduction saltatory conduction and that, that just means leaping conduction. It has nothing to do with salt, uh, has everything to do with saltaire, which means to leap. So it leaps from node to node, of course, within the axon. Action potentials only travel within neurons. They don't travel within glia. The action potential does not jump out of the axon and into the myelinating glia. It stays within the axon the whole way. Now in that passive propagation, even though it's fast, it's also lossy. We lose some degree of depolarization because it spreads out. So it becomes less concentrated. We reconcentrate it at the nodes. So that's the purpose of having these nodes. We can't myelinate the entire stretch of axon because the, the positive signal would just decay before it got to the synapse. So we have nodes to recharge. We have two types of myelinating glia. The oligodendrocytes are in the central nervous system. Oligodendrocytes means that they myelinate multiple dendra, I'm sorry, they, they myelinate uh, multiple axons. All right, not just one. They're gonna hit multiple segments on different axons. Schwann cells hit only one little tiny section of one axon. The more important difference though is the type of myelin that they create. This is what actually matters. Oligodendrocytes live in the central nervous system and that is encased in a skull. The skull provides plenty of mechanical protection. So they create a very compact myelin. They don't need to make a cushion. We have a skull outside of your central nervous system. So in the periphery where Schwann cells live, we are subject to bumps and we don't wanna damage our axons. So they create a very pillowy and loose form of myelin. So it's not as compact. We don't have to worry about saving space. We only have so much space within our skulls. We got a lot more space out here. We're not encased in a bony structure. So we create pillowy, soft myelin in the peripheral nervous system. <clears throat> uh, microglia are considered a glial cell, but they're not actually uh, derived from nerve cells. These uh, come from the yolk sac and they actually immigrate into the brain. Uh, so these are macrophages that enter early on in development and then they live there for the rest of their lives. Uh, so these are, these are uh, expats who come into the nervous system and live there. And their job is to find anything that's uh, damaged or shouldn't be there and destroy it. So these are gonna be the macrophages uh, because not every neuron makes it. Cells die and when cells die, we should get rid of them. That's the logic. So microglia are gonna play a very important uh, role in removing cell debris and responding to damage. Sometimes damage happens. And when they do that, they're gonna change their structure because they're changing their function. I'm sure you've heard structures function, it's true. So let's have a look down here on the bottom. The top is just showing us a little cartoon that uh, microglia come from the yolk sac and come live in the brain, great. Down the bottom, 
we have resting microglia. Nothing wrong in panel A. And notice they kind of look like little neurons. They got their little cell body and then there's these little processes that they send out. What they're looking for are signs of damage. They're looking for any pro-inflammatory cytokines or any uh, cellular components that indicate that a cell has been damaged. They're not really forming synapses, maybe. They're looking for damage. And that's why they extend these little fine processes. If there is damage, they change their shape. Notice the difference between A and C. These are far more amoeboid, so they're rounded up. They don't have those long processes. They round up so they can migrate. What they want to do is go find that site of injury and destroy anything that shouldn't be there. So they retract their processes and they crawl. That's their job. And when they get there, they eat. They remove the debris and any foreign invader. They can also bring in backup if things are, are getting too, too nasty for them. The last cell to bring up would be astrocytes. Astrocytes have a variety of functions. Um, and, and so they, they have these fairly elaborate morphologies. Uh, that is, they have a bunch of processes that come out of their cell body. And different processes do different things. Uh, so let's have a look right here on this top picture. Uh, the white signal is showing you GFAP. That's an intermediate filament that you'll find mostly in astrocytes, but some other cells have it. This is just a part of the cytoskeleton that helps us see the cell. That's it. So all the white here you're looking at, here's an astrocyte. There's an astrocyte everywhere, an astrocyte. Notice this vessel running through the picture. That's a blood vessel. Astrocytes are going to surround blood vessels and help create the blood-brain barrier. They are not the blood-brain barrier, but they help create it. They make sure that the epithelial cells in our blood vessels maintain tight junctions so nothing leaks out because the brain is very delicate and neurons don't create more of themselves. So you have what you have for the most part. There's a couple areas that might make a few neurons, but if you lose uh, neurons, they're gone. They, like you, are special and irreplaceable. The input processes are going to do a couple of things. They're going to maintain the blood-brain barrier, and they're also going to help regulate blood flow. If neurons are highly active, we need more blood there. Remember, nothing's free. So they open up blood vessels a little wider and allow a little more blood flow so we can pull out glucose oxygen, and we can pay the bill. So input processes help regulate blood vessels. Perinodal processes are near the nodes, as the name suggests. So they go to those nodes in between the myelin sheaths, and they make sure that all the potassium that the neuron is spitting out in the action potential gets removed so it doesn't build up. They're also going to feed that portion of the axon a little bit of glucose or a little bit of pyruvate so we can pay the bill. So it's good that astrocytes are connected to the blood. That helps us pay the bill. We're gonna pay the bill in the axon. We're gonna pay the bill in the dendrites too. We also have perisynaptic processes. Here's one shown in green. This is a, uh, a, a cartoon version of an electron micrograph. We got our presynaptic site with the little yellow vesicles of neurotransmitter. And we got our postsynaptic site with this dark blue postsynaptic density filled with neurotransmitter receptors. When we spit out neurotransmitter, we need to clean it up. You can always have too much of a good thing. Hell, you're looking at the clock right now thinking, when is this good thing going to end? The same thing is true whenever people spit out neurotransmitters. We got to clean it up. If we don't clean up that glutamate, bad things happen. More on that in two lectures. Hell, more on that in, uh, oh, sorry, more on that as soon as we advance the slide. So these perisynaptic processes, not only are they gonna feed metabolic substrates, just like perinodal, they have uh, neurotransmitter transporters. These are proteins that transport neurotransmitters out of the synapse, so they don't build up to toxic levels. So when this presynaptic site spits out its glutamate to excite the postsynaptic target, that glutamate gets removed. So we have a very brief period where we allow excitation, then we remove it so we don't kill the downstream neuron. What would happen if we didn't have those glutamate transporters? Well, nothing good, that's for sure. So what we're looking at here are data from excitatory amino acid transporter eat knockout mice. In other words, they removed glutamate transporters from the astrocytes 
and they saw how the mice developed. Well, they made it uh, to birth. In A, we're looking at their growth. So the increase in body weight in a normal mouse is shown in these open circles. The filled circles would be the knockout mice. Notice they don't grow quite as big. They also don't survive as long. So let's look in panel B here. All mice should be able to survive for 12 weeks. That's nothing. But you'll see here that these mice without glutamate transporters die within a couple of weeks after birth. You see marked death and that continues. Mice continue to die far sooner than they should have. That's because glutamate is toxic if we don't clean it up. It's too much of a good thing. In C, we can see a seizure in a mouse because that glutamate is hyper exciting its neurons. That creates seizure activity. And here we can see the EEG showing these epileptiform events, seizures in other words. Top is a normal mouse, nice low amplitude, high frequency EEG lower frequency, high amplitude EEG, showing us seizure, seizure. Here we can see it. The effect of that is death. So we need our astrocytes to take care of our neurons. Astrocytes and microglia are gonna have an additional function and that is to undergo what we call reactive gliosis. The microglia are gonna round up so they can migrate to an area of injury. The astrocytes are going to swell and create a glial scar. So they create scar tissue. They modify the extracellular matrix to prevent diffusion. Because if we have an area of severe damage, we're going to actually recruit white blood cells to that area. That's especially true if we have, let's say a, a puncture wound and we actually rupture uh, blood vessels, then we'll definitely have blood there. That blood is toxic to neurons. So we create a glial scar to help section off the area of injury so blood and other toxic substances can't diffuse away and damage neurons. The glial scar is actually very important for protecting neurons. The problem is that it also prevents regrowth. This is one of the issues in spinal cord injury. Damage to axons in the spinal cord is irreparable for the most part. Certainly uh, far less reparable than damage to peripheral axons. Part of that has to do with the myelin, but part of it also has to do with the glial scar. So what astrocytes do with damage is form a scar and then work together with microglia to stimulate inflammation. Microglia act as macrophages to help clean up the damage, but they also work with astrocytes to stimulate inflammation and recruit white blood cells if we have profound damage. So that's what we're talking about whenever we say reactive gliosis. Now you'll notice that astrocytes change their structure. You might imagine that causes them to change their function and you would be totally right. We don't fully understand what's going on here, but we do appreciate that there is a change in their ability to, for example, clean up glutamate. That's not a good thing as we just saw in the last slide. So this reactive gliosis is good to a point. Whenever we have prolonged or profound reactive gliosis, that can impair the normal function of astrocytes and have disastrous effects on neurons. We will see this time and time again in this class. All right, I'm gonna pause here and see if we have any questions. I certainly have questions. Unfortunately, I don't have time for you to, to go through them. So you'll be on your own for that. <clears throat> Are there any questions before we let out? All right, cool, cool. So uh, there are two slides called checkpoints. Um, since we're delivering the lecture rather than going through a recording beforehand, we probably won't have time to get to these in most classes, but you should take some time to go through them. There's a reason I give you questions. If you find that you can answer them very easily and everything makes sense, great. If you find that you can't answer them easily uh, by yourself or with your classmates, reach out to me. And we can get together and talk about these to make sure that you're getting uh, what I'd like you to get. If you have no questions for me, then I'm going to call it a class. I'll see you in person uh, next week. I will also see you virtually tomorrow for SI2. All right. Well, that does it. See you tomorrow. Have a great day.